What happens after we die? This simple question has fueled wars, mass fear, and great debate since man first walked the earth. But it's the living, not the dead, that raise all the ruckus. The dead are dead. <laughs> you can't help them. <laughs> you can't help them, but maybe they can help you. They might even help catch a killer. I know that we have helped solve several cases uh, by the research we have uh, performed here. At the University of Tennessee, a unique and what some might call creepy forensic research facility exists to answer questions few dare to ask. Behind a locked fence lay dozens of corpses in varying stages of decay. It's known to some as the body farm. This one-of-a-kind facility covers almost three acres. So you're right now at the Anthropological Research Facility, uh, which is a part of the Forensic Anthropology Center here at the University of Tennessee. Uh, we started this facility in 1981. The main focus of our existence is to study uh, human decomposition. Under each of these plastic tarps is a body. But some also lay exposed. Some are placed in cars, and some are hidden underground. More than 150 populate the property. Each has been donated for the purpose of study. And as it turns out, the dead can weave long and intricate tales for trained receptive experts. It's extremely important to study human decomposition. One of the major things that uh, people ask for is how long has someone been dead? What is that post-mortem interval, as we call it? But the length of time a person has been dead isn't that easy to establish. Time since death is very important because perpetrators typically have an alibi. Uh, if you can determine that they don't have an alibi at the time when the, uh, the time since death has been determined for an individual, uh, you could possibly pin the perpetrator to the crime. There are four major stages of decomposition that human bodies undergo. The first is the fresh, or autolysis stage, in which cells and organs begin to chemically break down. That breakdown generates the growth of bacteria that eats away at the soft tissue, generating gases, which begin to bloat the body. That bloating, or putrefaction, is stage two. The third stage is decay, when the body eventually ruptures and all liquids and gases escape. At the end of the third stage, only the bones remain. The final stage is skeletonization, the deterioration of the bones themselves, which will take thousands of years. This donation is what we consider advanced decomposition or initial skeletonization. One of the first things that becomes skeletal is the, the skull. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you have more openings in your head and you have less tissue on your head. And then one of the last things that tends to kind of go away is the, the torso area, which is right here. Um, and a lot of that's because if you think about how much muscle and how much tissue you have in those regions. These bodies provide valuable insight for forensic students and officials from all segments of law enforcement, from local to federal agencies, who come here to learn what a corpse can teach. This particular one appears to be an end of active decay. And uh, one of the interesting things about this particular individual is the formation of what we call adipocere or grave wax. It's very cheesy and, and, and kind of you know, gooey material. By looking at the composition and structure of the adipocere, uh, determine whether it was a very rapid decompositional process or if it was very slow. A rapid decomposition ends up with very crumbly type of adipocere. A slow decomposition is much more paste-like. Insect activity is a key tool in determining a timeline of decomposition. There's a specific reason that flies lay their eggs on the body in a certain location, why they hatch. I mean, this is a very important 
point to, to realize that the maggot mass doesn't just appear for no reason. And knowing all these things is all very important in doing um, forensic investigations. A corpse can even tell investigators where it's been. Here you have what we call true skeletonization, where there isn't any remaining tissue. You can see every element from the skull uh, to the feet. This is the top of your head, and you can see it's much lighter in color. And then you move down and you have very dark colors, and that's because they were covered. The bones absorb the color of the surrounding soil, making them difficult to see. So how do you find a corpse that's buried or covered in the middle of nowhere? My two areas of expertise include determining how long someone's been dead and doing a clandestine grave detection. Here we see an example of a clandestine grave. Uh, a fresh grave, which is usually just a couple months old, will have a nice mound of dirt where the perpetrator refilled the grave after putting a body in there. As the decomposition process continues, the soft tissue liquefies and the ground sinks and subsides. But as time progresses and this thing fills back in with leaf debris and, and sticks and limbs like we see here, it becomes very, very difficult. And that's part of my research efforts here is trying to determine how to locate these graves to make the investigator's job much easier. Arpad Voss also oversees the longest running study at the facility, going on since 1990. Uh, in these particular graves, we have a piping system, and each one of these is at a different depth. The reason we did this piping system is so we can watch these volatile compounds called VOCs as they migrate up from the body through the soil column to the very surface. The volatile organic compounds comprise an unmistakable smell, the odor produced by a decomposing body. And this so-called sweet smell of death is more chemically complex than anyone thought. Through this study, we've determined that over 450 uh, compounds are liberated during the decompositional process. Uh, these are all found at the body. And as these odors and, and compounds and, and gases, so to speak, migrate up through the soil column, the list gets winnowed down to about 30 that are really prominent at the surface and that we've uh, found to be reproducible body to body. The goal of this study is to decipher these 450 compounds and create a sniffing technology that now only exists in nature. Human remains detection canines are absolutely phenomenal in their abilities. They have such low detection capabilities, probably better than a lot of the analytical instruments we have today. <laughs> Properly trained canine units are the most reliable method of finding a hidden grave. I have some cadaver material in a uh, little plastic container here, and uh, we're just hiding it, burying it under some leaves and brush uh, back here inside the woods a little ways. We know that they do not key on sight, they key on the scent, but we just like to just take a little extra precaution and, and bury it out of sight so, so there's no chance of him seeing it and cueing from that. Diesel, a two-year-old German Shepherd, is released more than 250 yards away from the concealed container. In under two and a half minutes, he zeroes in on the scent. His alert is what we call passive alert. First thing he does is he turns around, he eyeballs me very, very hard, becomes very, very stiff in his actions. And, and I know at that point he's in scent, probably is at the source of the scent. The only way to properly train these canines is to use actual human cadaver remains, which smell like no other animal tissue. He discriminates decomposing human tissue from decomposing any kind of other tissue, uh, whether it's pig, cow, horse, deer, groundhog, anything else. He'll totally ignore it and just walk right by it. Arpad Voss hopes his work at the body farm will yield technology that will surpass even Diesel's prodigious talent. 
and it will all be thanks to the generosity of the dead. If you look at the types of donors that we attract, a lot of them are educators, law enforcement, health care professionals. And one of the things that they always say is they want to teach people beyond their current life. This land, however, is not the final resting place for these donations. Once the decomposition process is complete, all bones are stored in the anthropology center, housed in the basement of the university football stadium. Each donation is painstakingly cleaned, boxed, and cataloged. It has become the most extensive modern collection of human bones for anthropological study in the United States. Though you might be surprised to find decomposing bodies and boxes of bones on a university campus, you would expect to find them here. Welcome to the Dauphin County Coroner's Office in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where 23-year veteran coroner Graham Hetrick sees an average of 23 corpses a week. Their first destination is the refrigerator. Contrary to movie and TV lore, most modern morgues use walk-in refrigeration units rather than morgue drawers. It's simply easier to move a corpse on a gurney than lift it into a drawer. In most cases, refrigeration units nowadays are refrigeration rooms so that gurneys can be moved in and out. The purpose of a coroner's office is to investigate and determine the cause of every sudden, violent, or unusual death that occurs. This is almost always done by conducting an autopsy. This is an autopsy table. It generally is an L like this with a separate area for dissection and examination and this area for the body to be. The body is then actually incised, or there is a cut, a Y cut made, and the body is opened up. Every organ is examined and described for the record. Each clue studied, photographed, and documented. The most common tool in an autopsy is the scalpel. But the most lurid is the striker saw. I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is, of course, who would want their head sawed open? And the second reason is that famous sound. But perhaps the most important tool is not even surgical. There is one tool that is pretty much unique uh, and used more often in the forensic autopsy, and that is the ruler. <laughs> because what we want to do is we want to take exacting measurements of wounds and of the uh, location of those wounds on the body. These measurements provide investigators key facts about the subject's death. From the angle of a bullet to the last meal consumed, nothing is insignificant in unraveling the story of the deceased. My job and the job of any coroner or medical examiner is to speak for the dead. I want to tell their story. I don't want to tell the story in light of what the DA wants to hear or the defense wants to hear. I want to tell an independent story of what the evidence tells us. That is what good forensics is. Corpses can tell untold stories, but they can do much more. They can make the blind see, allow the injured to heal, and even save lives. When the worst happens, and a tragedy occurs, there just might be something incredible to come from it. Because the dead can save lives. The purpose of life is to love and be of service. And what greater way to be of service than to actually literally give of ourselves. One deceased organ donor can save the lives of eight other people. At any given moment, there are approximately 100,000 people awaiting an organ transplant in the United States. Heart, kidneys, lungs, pancreas, liver, and intestines 
Today, we have the ability to transplant almost every vital organ in the body. The time between the recovery of the organs and the transplantation of the organs is probably the most critical time factor because the clock is ticking. Organs can only stay outside the body for so long. When a donor meets the strict medical parameters for organ donation, the recovery agency schedules an operating room and a transplant surgeon recovers viable organs for transplantation. One way to help keep an organ viable outside the body is with a process called perfusion. Jim Locke has perfused more than 500 kidneys in his tenure as a certified transplant organ perfusionist. Kidneys were the first organ to be successfully transplanted over 50 years ago. And they are perhaps the most durable human organ. This machine won't make a bad kidney good, but it certainly will, it's like the army, it'll be all it can be and we'll get the information necessary to let us know if it's gonna function immediately or if it's gonna be delayed or if it's not gonna work at all. Ready to go. But beyond life-giving organs, the dead can also gift us with tissues that save and heal. Donated tissue from one corpse can change the lives of more than 200 people. When people donate tissue, it really involves donation of various tissue forms. Categories of tissue donation include ligaments, tendons, bone, nerves, skin, veins, heart valves, and even corneas. LifeNet Health has helped heal more than a million and a half people through its tissue banking services. It's one of the top three providers of organ recovery and tissue banking services in the United States. Tissue banking differs from organ donation in many ways. First, unlike organs for transplant, tissue is frozen. This is one unprocessed donor. Our freezers here will hold approximately about 20 donors per door. We have 56 doors, so we can store over 1,000 donors at one time. Each donor is about 28 to 30 pieces of tissue. And from those 28 to 30 pieces of tissue, LifeNet Health can create more than 300 different biomedical implants that can improve the lives of the recipients. Since its founding in 1982, LifeNet Health has expanded from three employees to hundreds while perfecting the system of tissue processing. We have recovery teams here in Virginia, but also work with recovery agencies throughout the country. They have teams that go and recover the tissue from a donor and send it here. Once that donor is cleared and released for processing, we, we bring it back into our certified clean rooms and, and process clinically implantable grafts out of that donated tissue. Preparing human tissue to be used for medical procedures takes patience, time, and a tight system of checks and balances. Quality is the most important thing we do here. We have to put up quality tissue grafts uh, that the surgeons can use. You can see there's some fiber separation, but we caught at one of our inspection points. The tendon just started to fray apart a little bit like that. That will ultimately fail in a patient, so we can't put that up now. Two technicians work in sync double-checking measurements, quality, and performance. The grafts processed here might be used for such diverse operations as spinal fusions, dental implants, and knee repair. By far, the most common use of tissue grafts is for sports-related injuries. Probably the largest growth segment that we have as an industry in sports medicine as the baby boomers like myself are getting older and being weekend warriors, we're tearing up everything. It takes approximately 90 days for the tissue from one donor to be fully processed, packaged, and shipped out. From small boxes to liquid nitrogen containers. The orders keep the packaging and shipping departments busy 24-7.
Within the last 25 years, the amount of tissue in the body that can be donated and recycled has more than tripled. While some of the dead save and improve lives through organ and tissue donation, others save lives through education. For the last 40 years, the University of Toledo has run a body donation program that allows medical students the privilege to learn about the body from the outside in. I have the utmost respect for people that donate their bodies because they are giving us the ultimate gift of learning. So can someone show me the, uh, the, out, the, the surface um, landmark for the clavicle? You can read in a book, um, you can look at uh, countless pictures, but there's absolutely no substitute to the hands-on learning that you get from dissecting a cadaver. Oh, okay, all right. It helped me mature as a medical student. We use the term cadaver, which is someone who's dead. But in my mind, a cadaver is someone who's more than that, someone here who's made the decision to give their body for instruction so that our students can really get some value out of what really is just the remnant of their earthly self. Medical cadavers contain no blood, as they are specially embalmed for lengthy preservation. This process enables students to see and feel what goes on inside the body. A cadaveric dissection is for the purpose of exploring the entire human body, uh, from superficial to deep, examining all systems of the body, but really from the perspective of students learning it for the first time or for, or for review purposes. And if people are willing to donate, um, that's awesome. I know I'm planning on donating my body after going through this experience, just, you know, giving back to, you know, science, which is going to be our careers, uh, I think is excellent. Thanks to the dead, researchers here were able to create valuable virtual education software. Three of us anatomists and a, a medical illustrator uh, have developed a, a software product uh, which can be used very nicely to supplement or enhance the study of cadaver dissection. Over a decade in the making, their software called Anatomy and Physiology Revealed contains thousands of images of the human body presented in a whole new way. Each anatomical layer from more than 125 different dissections was photographed and stacked and realigned on the computer. The program allows successive layers of anatomy to be melted away. Skin becomes transparent to reveal muscles, which can be melted away to reveal deeper structures. Today, what you'll do is palpate the clavicles and the notch between them. Though groundbreaking, this software doesn't eliminate the need to work with the real thing. It was a little scary. It was kind of surreal. You know, the first time you're, you know, cutting into you know, a real person, um, but uh, it's a really cool experience too. More than 5,000 corpses are donated to medical schools in the United States each year. But this figure is dwarfed by the tens of thousands of corpses of non-donors. Still, donors and non-donors alike can use the services of the massive industry that houses and prepares them for their final journey which could be six feet under. Death is inevitable for all of us, and we cope with its sobering finality with rituals. Man is not truly that rational, and death is one of those things that we cannot even express in verbal form, so we surround it with tradition. In the Western world, a business with almost 200 years of tradition is the funeral home. Here, morticians can give the illusion of holding death at bay. The primary component in this practice is embalming. The embalming process is one in which we really create an artificial circulation system. Embalming fluid is the main ingredient in this unique amalgamation of technology and tradition. The process is circulatory, but we don't have the heart, so what we need is a machine 
to produce the pressure within the arteries so that we can push the blood out and put the embalming fluid in. And that's done by what they call an embalming machine. And the embalming machine essentially creates the same type of situation that you would have with a heart pumping. The hose of the machine is most often inserted into the common carotid artery in the neck. The blood is replaced with the chemical fluid as the pumping of the embalming machine pushes the corpse's blood through the entire body and out through an incision in the jugular. Nearly 10 pints of blood, the average for an adult male, are simply flushed down the drain. In ancient Peru and Egypt, spices and oils were used to help preserve the body in a mummified state. During the Crusades, European apothecaries experimented with preservative recipes. And during America's Civil War, embalming came to the attention of a skeptical public. Arsenic and formaldehyde allowed medical doctors to successfully embalm and transport dead soldiers great distances back to their families for burial. When Abraham Lincoln was embalmed, Americans embraced the practice as both sanitary and civilized. But perhaps the greatest early example of a successful embalming was in 1924 with the demise of Vladimir Lenin. Doctors and scientists devised a powerful concoction of chemicals to preserve the Russian revolutionary. Lenin's corpse is still on permanent view at his mausoleum in Moscow, although every year or so he gets a little primping. As much as modern chemicals can preserve a body, so too can certain geographic locations. In the peat bogs of Denmark, the most well-preserved body from prehistoric times was discovered in 1950. This fourth century BC farmer was preserved by acidic bog water that essentially acted as a pickling agent on the body. The acid makes it impossible for any bacteria to grow. Therefore, organic material doesn't decompose. But as good as this naturally preserved corpse looks, it probably wouldn't pass muster with a modern mortician. Today, morticians like Nathan Bittner are skilled at what is called restorative art that he demonstrates with a student volunteer. This gentleman here, he certainly has uh, more color than a, a, a corpse that we normally work with. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll try to make uh, everything look even. Well, what I'm first going to do is try to figure out a color that will help blend evenly. And of course, we'll have to do the whole his whole fingers, his whole hands. His hands will be viewable, and we'll certainly do his face as well. You want to try to make sure the face and the hands are consistent in color. As in any profession, it helps that a funeral director takes pride in his work. When it comes to the deceased, they're really our canvas. So when it comes to being able to cosmetize correctly, we, we're going to want to make it look uniform and, and to make it look as natural as possible. And let's not forget the most symbolic and perhaps most necessary of all funeral accoutrements, the casket. Here is where choices abound, ranging from plain pine boxes to solid bronze coffins that will seal your fate. More than 1.7 million are buried annually. The trappings of tradition might cost you a pretty penny. From the funeral home costs, to a casket, to a cemetery plot, an average U.S. funeral runs anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000. Therefore, you might choose to look to another final ritual as an alternative, albeit a fiery one. United States cemeteries cover millions of acres of land, often valuable land. So what's a body to do? Each year, almost 800,000 Americans will choose cremation over a cemetery burial. Projections suggest that by the year 2025,
close to two million corpses will be cremated every year. The cremation process is one where the body uh, is reduced to its elements through flame, heat, and vaporization. Facultative Technologies, headquartered in Medina, Ohio, is the leading U.S. manufacturer of cremators. In the last 25 years, there has been a significant increase in the consumer's demand and request for cremation. The cremator is essentially an oven designed to facilitate the combustion process. While this might sound simple, it's anything but. There are two chambers inside the cremator. The primary chamber is where the combustion of the body and its container or wrappings takes place. This combustion emits gases and particulate matter, such as ash and carbon monoxide, which travel to the secondary chamber, where final incineration occurs at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Evidence of an incomplete combustion process is what you typically see uh, when you see smoke in a perfect environment where you control the temperature, the oxygen concentration with that fuel, there would be no visible evidence that a combustion process was taking place other than perhaps a radiation of some heat waves that you would see. That's what Facultative Technologies has claimed to accomplish with its new state-of-the-art FT3 cremator. If you're in the market for one, it could set you back a cool $180,000. This is the bottom chamber. We commonly call it the secondary combustible chamber. And here you see the brickwork in place to the level where we would now uh, start putting in the primary combustion chamber. This machine over here now has had the uh, primary combustion chamber virtually completed. These tiles here are the half tiles where the casket would uh, sit on for cremation. In this machine and over here, we've uh, uh, got to the point now where Chuck, our master bricklayer here, is uh, repointing the brickwork for, for the arch. I've been doing this for two years now. Just another day. It's a clean machine, it's new, it won't bother you. The brick itself has been specifically designed by ceramics engineers to withstand extremely high temperatures. Well, we have different types of brick with different thicknesses, obviously, but uh, generally there's, uh, there's over 1,100 bricks in this machine. Uh, and each brick has 42% uh, of lumen content and is capable of going up to 2,300 degrees. Natural gas fuels the primary chamber, heating it to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes about 20 minutes to reach this temperature for its first run of the day. And in case you're wondering, that intense heat enables the FT3 cremator to turn a corpse to ash in about 60 minutes. The cremators made here are not only crafted by hand, but also custom designed for each client. We had two cremators here on site, and uh, we've been using them over the past six to eight years. But the things that we're finding now with the new technology is that we're able to not only enhance the speed of the cremation, but use less natural resources, and then also the emissions are much more favorable. The operator merely presses a button, and the automated process begins. The natural gas fire adjusts itself as it gets information from temperature sensors, called thermocouples, in the brick walls of both chambers. An integrated fan system is critical in regulating the amount of oxygen circulated. Without oxygen, there would be no flame, but too much could cause damage. In this demonstration, an empty wooden casket is reduced to burning embers in just 20 minutes. These embers resemble the result of an actual cremation, commonly called the ashes. But the term is a misnomer, as they aren't ashes at all, but bone fragments that will be pulverized into a fine dust. All the soft tissue has been vaporized. So the operator will rake all the cremated remains into the ash chute. This ash chute is a uh, refractory line because the ashes at this particular time are hot. They would fall down, as you can see here, down to this chute part here, and they will rest on this cast iron tray here. 
This part of the machine is actually a, a small air plenum where, once fitted, we inject uh, cold air across the ashes to out, actually help the ashes to cool down. Within two minutes, this machine will pulverize the bone fragments into granules no larger than 3.2 millimeters in diameter. When completely ground, the ashes weigh an average of five to six pounds and are transferred to an Ritual cremation is nothing. For the last 2,500 years in the ancient city of Varanasi, India, corpses have been set afire on the banks of the Ganges as part of religious ceremonies. It takes at least six hours to incinerate one body and usually requires burning more than 600 pounds of wood. Some have estimated that 50 million trees a year are cut down to provide the wood pyres. Tens of thousands of cremations occur here every year. The ashes from each are poured into the Ganges, where it's believed the soul meets the Hindu gods in the sacred waters. Back in the United States, five pounds of ashes also need a home. So how about this for a final resting place? Located about three miles off the Miami coast and 45 feet below the ocean surface, rests this unusual memorial reef maintained by the Neptune Society. Designed as a lost city, it is the largest man-made reef of its kind in the world. It contains more than 125,000 niches for urns and holds secure the remembrances of the dearly departed for all time. The Neptune Society has created alternative funeral options since 1973, when it offered the choice of scattering the deceased's ashes at sea. Today, its memorial reef is yet another option for ocean lovers and non-traditionalists. The reef not only serves as a final resting place for ashes, but also as an undersea breakwater that reduces erosion, encourages a thriving marine habitat, and creates a scuba haven. But what if cremation isn't for you? Can a corpse be green? One company thinks so. Whether it's the 50 million trees for the fuel to feed the funeral pyres of Varanasi, or the 1.7 million caskets a year that house the dead in the United States, the business of disposing of corpses is a resource-consuming and costly venture. Americans pay $20 billion a year to keep the elements at bay from their buried dead. One cemetery has a different idea. From the time we're born, we use the earth. We use it for sustenance. We, we feed off the earth, we breathe the air, we rely on the sunshine to make everything grow. It only makes sense that when we go, we can recycle ourselves and give back to the earth that gave us life in the first place so that the earth can continue to give life to others. Forever Fernwood, 15 miles outside of San Francisco, was established in 1892 on 32 acres. Now it has taken a new approach to the concept of the final resting place. Natural burial is back to basics. It's earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We do natural burial without the use of uh, chemicals like formaldehyde. Um, if a family doesn't wish to use a casket, they don't even have to. But if they do, we use 100% biodegradable caskets made of sustainable woods like pine. Uh, if they don't wish to use a casket, they could be wrapped in a shroud and placed directly into the earth. This is where the dead go green. Everything that's buried here will naturally degrade and fertilize the soil. The natural burial portion of Forever Fernwood spans about 20 acres, enough for more than 8,000 bodies. This open space feels more like a park than a cemetery, and that's the idea. But just because it's all natural doesn't mean 21st century technology doesn't play a part. Forever Fernwood has combined the Green Revolution with the latest in global positioning satellite tools. 
Technology has been a great help, even when we're dealing with natural burials. We're able to locate any grave, we're able to locate any person who's buried using GPS and GIS technology. This GPS receiver provides accurate electronic maps for what lies beneath. Very handy for finding an empty plot or a departed friend. When we bury somebody, in order to be able to locate them later on, we use what's called a radio frequency ID tag. This little pink ball is buried with the person. It's the only thing that's not biodegradable that's put there, and that's intentional because we want this to last for about 500 years. We then use this apparatus, which I believe the technical term is the yellow ray gun. Um, we turn it on, and this is able to locate exactly where this is. This bulky ray gun will soon be replaced with a PDA-sized version that will allow visitors to find their destination with ease. Forever Fernwood's biggest difference from traditional cemeteries lies below ground. For the last eight decades, most cemeteries have required the deceased to be buried not only in a coffin, but also that the coffin rest inside a concrete vault which provides support for the ground directly above it. Concrete vaults have been utilized in order to keep a grave from collapsing. When the weight of the earth presses down on a casket over time, it'll cause that casket to collapse, which means on the surface you have a big gap, uh, which means the lawn doesn't look very nice. But here on the open meadowland, dips, curves, and cracks in the soil are barely noticeable and seem natural. We have an old-world solution when a grave collapses. We just add more dirt to the top. Technology with sustainability is the motto here. This natural cemetery is one of very few in the United States, but at least five more are planned. Perhaps its success represents how breaking from tradition may not be a bad thing. With natural burial, not only is there no negative impact, but there's a positive impact. That tree that's planted on your grave is going to be sucking up all that CO2, and it's going to be breathing out oxygen for the next century at least. A simple burial like one at Forever Fernwood may seem odd in today's world, but it's just another example of an old idea.